Good evening. There we go. <laughs> and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Ryan Davis, and I'm the chair of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, note the exit doors, which are located on the park, on the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag IOPMayors, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming the student coordinator for the new mayor's program, Chris Kwong, who will introduce our panel. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum here at Harvard Kennedy School and the Institute of Politics. My name is Chris Kwong, and I'm the incoming chair of the Harvard Political Union. And on behalf of the Institute of, my, the Institute of Politics, it is my pleasure to introduce and to welcome over 30 mayors and mayors elect from across the country to Harvard this week for the Seminar on Transition for Newly Elected Mayors. Together with the US Conference of Mayors, the Institute of Politics has developed a diverse agenda of policy, media, public and private sector experts, including Harvard Kennedy School professors and sitting and current, or former and sitting mayors to share their expertise and experiences with our new mayors here this week. Special thanks go to Tom Cochran and Tom McClyman of the US Conference of Mayors, as well as Virginia Mayor, who works with Boston Mayor Marty Walsh for their support and leadership in planning this conference. And thanks, as always, goes to Director Bill Delahunt of the Institute of Politics for his leadership. The New Mayor's Conference is an opportunity for collaboration, information sharing, and support for new mayors who are facing complex issues across the country. And we're honored to have them here at Harvard this week. So at this moment, I'd like to invite all of our new mayors who are here with us in the room to stand and be recognized. And immediately following tonight's forum, we invite all of you to join us and our new mayors directly behind the forum stage here for a reception, food and drink, and an opportunity to mix and mingle with our honored guests. And with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's panelists and the moderator, Yora Tijang. Thank you. Welcome everyone, uh, it's great to see such a uh, great crowd coming out. Congratulations to all the mayors elect uh, for getting elected. Uh, enjoy the time here before, it's the calm before the storm I guess. Um, we have uh, an amazing panel tonight. I'm extremely um, honored to introduce uh, Mayor Buttigieg from South Bend, Indiana, Mayor James from Kansas City and Mayor Sharon Weston Broom from Baton Rouge. Uh, they're, they're all public leaders that I deeply admire and respect, and I've had the pleasure of working with them in the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, in which uh, their cities all take part for a whole year. Uh, and we'll get an opportunity to learn from, um, from them tonight, uh, both from successes and struggles, and we're gonna talk about how mayors can make cities better, but also how cities can make the country better. Because there seems to be a moment where, or a movement even, of cities uh, around the country. Um, and uh, it's gonna be interesting to hear from you uh, what your perspectives, experiences are, and your advice maybe to the new mayors elect. Uh, so before we uh, get into a conversation of about 30 minutes, um, I'll share some uh, thoughts on city leadership to frame the conversation. And then we'll leave about 20 to 30 minutes for you to, to ask questions. Um, and if you ask a question, please identify yourself, your name, your affiliation, and really keep it a question. So we have a lot of lectures here at the Kennedy School, but we really want questions. So, uh, so then we'll have a lot of opportunity to actually respond to those questions. So 
The mission of the uh, Bloomberg uh, Harvard City Leadership Initiative is to advance the art, science, and most importantly, the practice of city leadership. Um, we offer mayors and their staff a year-long executive education program, uh, but we also engage students and faculty in fieldwork, applied research, and on-site support for innovation in cities. Uh, so if you're a student, you want to get in involved in this work, uh, please let us know, because we're connecting students, faculty, and cities to make innovation happen in cities. So what does city leadership really mean, and why is innovation such an important part of it? Well, let me first say the most depressing definition of a city is the following one. A city, and this is a real one, a city is the absence of physical distance between people and buildings. <laughs> now, isn't that inspiring, right? That really makes you feel good about cities, right? Uh, I prefer another definition. I think cities are concentrations of human potential. And cities are where many of our problems are but also where many new solutions are created. Cities are indeed, as this panel is called, laboratories of innovation. And we all know that there is no abundance of financial resources in cities, and therefore, most mayors are not innovators by choice. They're innovators by necessity. They have to. Uh, and uh, this is very hard work because innovation means change, and change requires leadership. Uh, President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson famously said, when the burdens of the presidency seem unusually heavy, I always remind myself it could be worse. I could be mayor. <laughs> now, mayors-elect don't get discouraged. It gets better. <laughs> uh, and uh, to illustrate that, uh, I'll, I'll uh, read a quote from a mayor of a nearby city who shared his deepest professional secrets with the Boston Globe last summer. He said, I went home every night for the first three months in office thinking, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And the worst part was, I couldn't talk to anyone about it because everyone around me helped me get elected. So I couldn't go to them and say, I'm not really thrilled about this job. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Walsh, of course, of Boston, just got reelected last month in a decisive victory, so he must have gotten the hang of it somehow <laughs> over the years and quite well. He's absolutely right, though. The current challenges facing city leaders are formidable. Rising inequality, rising sea levels, racial and class tensions in cities, housing shortages, chronic unemployment, and the constant specter of terrorism and other kinds of violence. Uh, it's a tall order. And at the same time, we continue to see fascinating innovations and great examples of public leadership on the city level. Even as our federal government stalls or backtracks on issues like immigration and climate change, cities continue to move forward, promising to uphold the Paris Agreement and to protect immigrants, uh, immigrant residents as sanctuary cities. So despite Lyndon Johnson's pessimistic view of being a mayor, cities are the level of government that works, where pragmatism rules and where leaders are accountable and get things done. And we have three inspiring leaders here today who've demonstrated great leadership in taking on these tough challenges in order to realize the full potential of their cities. Uh, so again, please join me in welcoming Mayor, Mayor Buttigieg, uh, Mayor James, and Mayor Westenbroom. <laughs> Mayor James, to start with you, Kansas City. Uh, you have been mayor for six years now? Yeah, I have indeed. Yeah. And so when you look back, what is the innovation or the new initiative that really impacted citizens that you were most proud of? Well, first of all, let me say thanks for having us here. Uh, and to all you new mayors, let me just say that I love my job. Mayors, being a mayor is the best job in politics. We don't spend a lot of time yakking and fighting and arguing. We spend all of our time getting things done. So thank you for taking on the task. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, put your hands in there and get real dirty real quick. Um, when I came in office in 2011, the city manager, uh, Troy Schulte, had ascended to that position in 2009. One of the first things he did was create a performance management system that had not previously existed in the city. Uh, that performance management system was effective internally, uh, but it was a silo. It was something that worked internally, nobody knew about it outside. 
uh, I thought that we could have a much greater impact by taking it public and altering it some. So we created KC Stat. KC Stat took our internal performance management system, married it with our citizen satisfaction survey, also married it with our 311 data, so that we had input from citizens coming in, we had the performance management system, and then we meshed it all together. For the first year, we looked at individual departments. But after that, what we started to do was to blend departments based on council uh, priorities and council committees that I appointed. For example, neighborhoods and public service, you're, it's not one department in the city that's going to deal with neighborhoods and public service. So we did have neighborhoods there. We had uh, waste management there. We had the water department. We had the police. We had fire. Uh, we had all the departments and health department, all of those departments that would contribute to a neighborhood and public safety came together. We set goals. We came together on a periodic basis, and we checked out where we were in relationship to those goals. Uh, we measured it. We counted it. And as we did that, our citizen satisfaction survey numbers went up. The citizens liked it, and they told us what to do, and then we found ways to implement it. So the citizens liked it. How did the staff like it? Staff loved it, and, and the reason staff loved it was because it was a way for some really bright people to finally show their stuff. Uh, we had uh, Kate and Julie, our uh, performance management gurus and our data gurus, started meshing all of this data together and started producing wonderful results, good targets. So it was a way for us to have staff participate in how the city was being run. When we had a KC stat meeting and all the staff from the various departments were there, the conversation was just as much between them as it was between the manager and I with them because we wanted them to help figure out more efficient ways to deliver the same services. Because one thing that's happening is the federal government didn't help us, to be quite honest, and state governments by and large don't help us. Uh, if we're going to get things done in cities, we need to be somewhat self-reliant, but the costs go up the revenue stays stagnant, goes up some, and we have to be more inventive, more imaginative, more innovative about getting basic things done, same high quality, but more efficient and at a cost that the budget will bear. So it sounds like, um, you know, KC Stat is a system to hold staff accountable for performance, but I hear you say conversation. Uh, so it sounds like there's learning going on as well. So what did you as a mayor do to make sure that this uh, KC stat system didn't turn into something that um, made staff unhappy and miserable, but actually engaged them in, well in the, the, the work of the that's city. That's always a problem when you do something like that. Some people might think that it's an uh, invitation for criticism. So one of the things that we did was we didn't criticize, we praised. We praised the positive results. When the citizen satisfaction survey showed that the citizens were satisfied, we held a press conference. Mm -hmm. And we would put those people involved in that particular area out front and introduce them and talk about the good things they did. Quarterly, we bring all of our staff together and talk and give out awards for people who've done extraordinary things. Uh, we tweet about them. We talk about them. We encourage the citizens to write in about them. We want to make sure that our staff knows that just because you are ridiculously underpaid considering your talents, and what you could get on the private market doesn't mean that we don't appreciate you. Right. So we don't want to get this into some sort of a situation where it's negative. We want to make it positive. And we showed them how what they did <coughs> lifted up everybody. And so in the satisfaction surveys, the citizens were saying that the water department was better, that public works was more responsive, whatever the case was, that leadership was good. So we always wanted to make sure that we were talking about the positives and making sure that those staff, every staff member knew that without their efforts and without their focus, we wouldn't be able to achieve. And we always talk about that. Can you give an example of uh, one policy area or one you know, priority of the council uh, where this worked particularly well? Um, well, one place where it's worked particularly well is with some of the things that we've done with our public works department. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure in Kansas City, 318 square miles, 6,300 lane miles <coughs> of road. We plow, when we plow snow, we plow snow the equivalent of two lanes of highway from San Diego to Boston and back uh, every time it snows. So when we start achieving uh, snow plowing better and citizens stop mm -hmm. complaining as much, 
And, and so what we did was somebody came up with the idea of making sure that we always knew where our snow plows were, so we GPS them. Mm -hmm. And so I would be on Twitter uh, in the emergency uh, uh, operations center uh, tweeting out about snow and talking to people on the phone, etc. And somebody would tweet that nobody had plowed their street. And I was able to send them directly to the website. They could look it up on their website and see where the snow plow was. And I had so much pleasure telling a couple of people that you say nobody was on your street. There's a snow plow that was on your street five minutes ago. Go look outside. Oh, yeah, okay, fine. There so we are. You're holding citizens accountable, too. Right? Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to make sure you set the record straight. Right. <laughs> Very interesting. And so, um, so it worked really well for Kansas City. Uh, for new mayors who are interested in implementing this system, wh what would your advice be? Because we, we know from research that has been done here at the Kennedy School that not every city has been successful in implementing this performance leadership strategy. Right. In fact, it's failed in many places. So what is your advice on, on adapting and adopting this practice? If I was going to keep one, two, there's got to be two aspects that I would absolutely insist on. One, a, if there's a city administrator, city manager, um, there needs to be a performance management system that holds staff internally accountable and sets goals that are reasonable and, and reachable. And number two, absolutely positively have a citizen satisfaction survey. That's where we differ from state and federal governments. Our citizens tell us very clearly the things that they think are important in their cities, and then it's up to us to use our facts and data and departments in order to achieve the things that they wanted. We just did that with an $800 million infrastructure bond uh, that required three property tax raises and 57.1% vote on each tax. And we, the lowest vote we had was 61%, and the, lowest was six, uh, the highest was 67 And the reason we had it was because the Citizen Satisfaction Survey had told us for five years, fix the roads, the streets, the bridges, and the sidewalks. So we put together a package that fixed the roads, streets, bridges, and sidewalks, flood control, leveraging federal money, ADA compliance, and, and government buildings. And we just walked out and told them time after time after time, this is what you said you wanted fixed. This is what we're going to fix. This is what it's going to cost. So if you want it fixed, here's the cost. Now's the time to step up. And they did. All right. Thank you. Moving to um, Baton Rouge, uh, Mayor Weston Broom, you've been in office for a little less than a year, but you've already launched uh, an impressive number of new initiatives. Uh, the one I like most is Mayor Broom's Clean Sweep event <laughs> <laughs> to make uh, Baton Rouge beautiful. <laughs> very uh, clever title. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to ask you about uh, a very serious issue, education, and this is something close to your heart. Can you talk about how you, even if you have no control over yeah. the public education system, mm -hmm. how you still as a mayor can bring people and parties together to improve uh, uh, education? Well, thank you so much, and I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, I came off of the campaign trail in December of last year, uh, took office in January, a very short period of time for transition, but I will tell you while I was on the campaign trail that one of the issues that came up consistently was the issue of education. In fact, I will tell you my opponent uh, pretty much did his whole campaign <laughs> around education. And the truth of the matter is that the mayor of Baton Rouge has little authority uh, from a policy point of view over education. However, I recognize that as the mayor of the city, I've got to be concerned about everything that impacts our city, and certainly quality education impacts our city. And so one of the first things that I did was to uh, bring our school board together with our city council. That had never been done before. There had been discussions on both ends from our school board, of course, and members of the city council about education, but they had never come together in a joint meeting to discuss education issues surrounding our city. And believe it or not, that went over really well, and there was a desire to continue those conversations. And then beyond that, uh, I signed myself to be the advocate in chief for education, and so I instituted our uh, mayor's education advisory committee and I asked two of our council members who had a background in education to lead that initiative. And so now they are in a sphere of bringing people together, stakeholders to discuss education issues uh, relevant to our city and parish. And, and thirdly, I'll say this, um, 
I got this innovative idea from uh, another city that was passed uh, to me during the course of the campaign, and it's the issue around early childhood education. I had the opportunity to be a part of the uh, Tulane Institute on Early Childhood Education, and uh, one of my colleagues said, you know, this is, a, this is something important for you when you become mayor. Well, at the time, I really couldn't see how it would all fit together. But certainly, as we talk about solutions to education and uh, elevating quality education, I recognize that we can't wait until children are in kindergarten. We have to start when they're in the cradle. And so I initiated our Cradle to K initiative, which is connected to our Head Start program in Baton Rouge. Now, the other question that we all usually get as mayors, how are you going to pay for that? <laughs> so that was one of the questions that we received. So our first phase was something that really didn't cost anything. We have a consultant who's been working with us, and our first phase involves peer-to-peer -peer, uh, counseling and uh, studying together around uh, parental issues of uh, children starting with the, with the parents when they, uh, before a mother gives birth, and we have launched that on social media. So that will be our first phase of, or is our first phase of our Cradle yeah. Decay initiative. So one of the most common barriers to these more holistic approaches, in this case of education or school readiness, is, you know, there is all different departments. Uh, you get your education uh, department, you get your, uh, you know, school board, the public health, um, uh, social benefits, um, buildings even, yeah. public works, and, and so if school readiness requires a collaborative effort of Absolutely. multiple departments, how do you as a mayor uh, lead across silos, so to speak, and, and what are some of the, the obstacles that you've uh, encountered and how have you overcome them? Well, uh, certainly um, City Parish, I say parish, we have parishes in Louisiana, has been known for, unfortunately, when I came in, operating in silos. So one of um, my first goals was to try to bring our department leaders together and to dismantle a culture of operating in silos. And so when we, we have our weekly departmental meetings, people are now finding out what's going on in another department and finding out how they can collaborate. And so with our education initiative, uh, our Department of Human Services took this on as part of, uh, of, of their project, and now they are getting partners from uh, other departments that are working with them to empower uh, their department, specifically around the project of Cradle to K. So uh, you, you said, you know, creating a culture of, of collaboration. Um, I, I remember seeing a cartoon that I really liked, the New Yorker cartoon, and it said something like, uh, the board has decided that the culture change will occur on Tuesday at 3 p.m., <laughs> right? So it's easily s easier said than done to it create is. a culture. S can you talk a little bit about how you personally, as a public leader, but also as the CEO of your organization, create that culture? What are the things that you do to make that work, the things that you say? Or yes. you know. Well, first of all, I, I, um, I try to have an uh, open line of communication. Um, I heard one mayor who you all probably know, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, Never heard of him. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, by the way, that <laughs> Mayor Pete <laughs> was tied with Michael Bloomberg for best mayor of America? <laughs> Don't pee. <laughs> <laughs> it's good company to be in. Well, uh, one thing I heard that Mayor Bloomberg does is that he has, an, uh, or did, he had an office that was open to everybody and everyone could come have access. Well, while I didn't have the budget to do that type of office, to reconstruct my office, I have made it very distinctively clear and very intentional that I have an open door policy to any and everyone, including not just our senior staff, but if you see my door open, that's an invitation for you to come in. And so that has been one way that I have uh, worked with our department leaders. But it's very important as a mayor that I cast a vision. and so. I spend time uh, going to our department leader meetings to make sure that they understand the vision that I have for the city and that they are a very integral part of that. So having that open line of communication is vitally important. Right. 
there's a story about Michael Bloomberg about the, the famous bullpen uh, in City Hall that you know somebody had not gotten the idea. Well, we need at least one conference room with a door. <laughs> so so Michael Bloomberg came in and saw that door. Didn't say anything, <laughs> but the next time he had that door removed <laughs> just to make sure that it was always literally open. Um, Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, moving on to South Bend, Indiana, um, Mayor uh, Pete, <laughs> uh, Ma uh, Mayor Buttigieg, is, is that the correct pronunciation? You got it just right, right but most people stick with Mayor Pete back home. I, I keep trying. <laughs> Mayor Pete, right? So this is how you're known in, in South Bend. So uh, you have um, done some remarkable things um, in many different areas, but especially on blight. Can you talk about your innovations in that area? Sure. So uh, first, I just want to say how special it is to be, uh, what an honor it is to be to be on, on this podium. It's not that maybe 12 or so years ago that I was up there kind of working up the courage to go to the mic and ask a question. And uh, my parents were asking whether I was attending Harvard or whether I was attending the IOP. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's really special to, to be here in this capacity. Uh, so yeah, one of the biggest challenges when, when I took office in 2012 had to do with vacant and abandoned housing. I think a lot of people who uh, may know of South Bend as the home of Notre Dame but don't know much about our, our history might not realize that we were an industrial town. We really were a company town for, for Studebaker uh, when that was a major automaker which, which came to a very abrupt end in 1963. And so the consequence was we lost about a quarter of our population across the 1970s and 80s. And by the time I was growing up, I didn't really realize, actually until I came out here, that, that it wasn't routine or normal to have vacant and abandoned factories and homes everywhere. Um, by the time I took office, it was clear from the calls we'd been making during the campaign that this was the number one issue that was on people's minds. Is what are we going to do about the boarded up houses? They're harmful. Uh, they're a bad look for the city. They're contagious because they could pull down the property values of those around them. And we knew we had to do something aggressive. Um, my instinct was to gather as much information as we could first. So even though I think uh, uh, new mayors have good reason to be a little skeptical of uh, agencies, task forces, commissions, and committees. Um, they can play a really important role, and we assembled a task force that blended the academic expertise we could tap at Notre Dame, uh, got all the people internally in the city who needed to be talking to each other, uh, folks from the county, private sector, neighborhoods, everybody who had some stake in the issue. Spent about a year assessing the problem and uh, found it was, I at the beginning, nobody could even tell us how many vacant and abandoned properties we had. Uh, so that was when we started getting more intentional about things like GIS mapping, making sure we understood uh, literally where the problem was. Uh, the mayor's office interns were informed that they were going to be code enforcement interns for now and went, went out and counted them. Uh, and then we started realizing we had to assess not just the condition of the houses, but the condition of the microeconomies of the neighborhoods. So we knew where they were more likely to, uh, to get uh, uh, bought if they were fixed up and where uh, there really wasn't going to be demand for a house for maybe 10 or 20 years or more. Then I realized that there was a risk of, of analysis paralysis. We knew what we needed to know, uh, but we still had to make a big move. And, and that was when uh, it, it was time to commit to a big goal. So uh, having gathered all of the information, uh, taken the public input, run the analysis, publicized our, our findings, uh, we gathered around a very almost childlike goal, which was uh, we're going to deal with a thousand houses in a thousand days. And Catherine Roos is somewhere in here. She's my uh, prior chief of staff and, and I think is uh, moderating a session tomorrow. I'll never forget the look on her face uh, when I proposed that in a meeting because everybody knew that uh, that was a goal that we could very easily and very publicly miss. But that was one of the most important ingredients. Uh, uh, another mayor who, who did a lot around innovation uh, when he was mayor of Baltimore, Martin O'Malley, has commented that the leadership has to do with making yourself vulnerable. And that doesn't just mean talking about your feelings. One of the ways you can make yourself vulnerable as a leader is to commit to a goal that can be very obviously and very publicly missed because that creates a kind of pressure. You're, you're putting a pressure on yourself. Uh, you're also, hopefully, the team wants you to succeed, and, and, and so you're creating a kind of healthy pressure behind the team, but also a kind of propulsion in the community mm -hmm. that wants to get this done. And so, uh, you know, I was by no means the first mayor to pay attention to the issue of vacant and abandoned houses, but we were able to get that extra lift to be able to address them at a faster pace than they were becoming abandoned in the first place and stop the contagion. So uh, we had an online scoreboard. You could literally log on every day and see how we were doing against our goal. And when day 1000 arrived, we, we had dealt with about 1,100 houses. And uh, it, it did several things. First of all, of course, intrinsically, it was a big improvement in our neighborhoods, but it also just built a level of confidence and trust in what we could do as a community that has made it a lot easier to take on some of the other challenges that came further down, down the way.
Yeah, so it was a, a campaign after the campaign, a campaign for uh, improving the conditions in the city. Have you uh, applied that same approach to other uh, policy areas as well? Yeah, we try to. One of the things we realize is the more information gets out there, it's kind of like the snow plows. Uh, you, you really, and, and it's a powerful antidote to, to, to alternative facts. I think one benefit that you have uh, as a mayor is, e even though there will always be some bizarre uh, uh, rumors spreading on Facebook about you, um, for the most part, it's very real. People know what's going on. Either I plowed, the, we plowed the snow well, or we didn't. There's a hole in the road, or there's not. It's not like proving whether or not you were born in the United States. You, people can just tell. And there's a power in that. And even when you're getting beat up, uh, you want it to at least be getting beat up over something that's real, because then hopefully you want that to be fixed just as much as the resident mm. who, who's making noise about it. And so uh, we did everything from uh, getting the uh, the checkbook of the city online. We set up the first uh, open data portal that an Indiana community had had. The open data allows us to push information, even on sensitive topics and, and topics that uh, sometimes look good and sometimes don't. Uh, uh, a lot of issues related to policing. We just push as much information out there as we can uh, because we know that, uh, uh, that it's always a healthier conversation when it's, when it's driven by facts. Yeah. So w one thing that comes through in all of your um, contributions is that uh, in order to, to make innovation work, in order to introduce new initiatives, you need collaboration across boundaries, you need data to actually know what you're talking about, but you also need a goal orientation. You know, there has to be tangible, measurable goals. Now, many mayors, when they start out, say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about the bureaucracy, right? All that red tape, you know, it's just bogging everything down and slowing everything down. Uh, did you have any of that in South Bend? And if so, what did you do? to take that on or to change No, no, no bureaucracy in South Bend. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a challenge. I mean, look, mid-sized Midwestern municipal governments are not necessarily known for being, you know, streamlined and innovative. And uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's an extent to which you do feel like you're battling a, a legacy culture um, where things were just done uh, maybe a different way. And, uh, you know, the, the benefit that, that I had, I, I was 29 when I got elected, and so you have kind of a mandate for change. Uh, I think when, when you run at, at that age, your, your face is your message, and you're going to be the candidate of new ideas and technology and innovation. Mm. Uh, even if you don't have any new ideas and, and don't uh, like innovation, <laughs> it's still <laughs> what people see in you and what they feel they're voting for. So we had that going for us. Um, I, I think the key was internally was, was to make sure you had the right people in the right seats, uh, and, and that's uh, uh, sometimes a painful but incredibly important process on the front end, I think, for any executive, but also to make sure that, that people felt empowered. Often somebody wasn't uh, maybe embracing innovation because they didn't know they were empowered to do it. They, mm -hmm. You know, the, the mentality of somebody in a bureaucracy is usually do no harm. And, and for, for two reasons, one of which is very good and the other of which is understandable. The very good reason is if you, don't, if you do harm and you're in the business of government, people get hurt. Um, the other reason is that uh, uh, people are incented that way, right? So, so they don't feel like there's a lot of room for maneuvering to try things that don't work out. The good news is you can try things that don't work out in ways that still don't harm residents. And that's where people need to know that they're empowered. To, to try something, you pilot it. I've learned that the word experiment is not good to use, but pilot you can get away with. <laughs> um, and if there's something that you think might work but you're not sure how, empower your team to try it out at a reasonably small scale and then see how it goes. And if it doesn't go well, reward them for having learned something meaningful out of it. And once people begin to realize that uh, they can actually advance their careers or advance their, their goal of, of public service by working with you on this, it begins to feel less like a cudgel that you're beating over the head, you must innovate, yeah. um, and more a way for them to do something that hopefully they, they've always wanted to do anyway but didn't have the tools. Thank you. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how, so we've talked about how mayors can make their cities better and create better city government organizations. Um, but cities as a level of government uh, are increasingly connected and taking action uh, to aim for a larger social change in the country and even worldwide. Uh, think about the, the Sanctuary Cities movement, the Welcoming Cities movement, Black Lives Matter movement, School Readiness movement, and others. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about how you as mayors, uh, you know, form a coalition uh, to promote, uh, you know, such, such goals and, and to work together to enact change? Mayor. Uh, James? Well, yeah. you know, first of all, I think, weren't we in the same class, Pete, when we came here? That's mayors? right, yeah. You know, so I've known Pete for as long as I've been a mayor, and I've known a lot of mayors. And there's this tradition of mayors working with each other, the older mayors. Strike that. The 
the ones that have been in office longer mayors, <laughs> working with those who haven't been in office as long, and that tradition just keeps rolling on because every year there's a new set of mayors coming in somewhere. Um, we've learned um, that the easiest way for us to succeed is to share ideas. So, you know, the climate mayors, for example, very proud to be part of that as you are, Pete. I've worked with Pete on, on political issues. I've worked with a lot of different mayors on a lot of things. I remember we had a, a problem with teenagers running amok in one of our shopping entertainment areas. Large groups of teenagers. I went down to see um, for myself and while I was there, literally a wall of kids was running at me. Three shots rang out, three kids were down on the ground. And the first person I called to find out about um, uh, there was a call for curfews. The first person I called was Michael Nutter of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. He was in the Caribbean, I think, on vacation when I called. He picked up the phone. We talked for a half hour. He told me who to call in his office to get various bits of information, what I could expect because he had had a similar issue in Philly. And we just share ideas. And we are always looking to work together. And the interesting thing is, is that I don't remember anybody ever telling me no because you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican. I don't even remember asking mm -hmm. whether anybody was a Democrat or a Republican because nobody really cares. Uh, at the mayor's level, the snow doesn't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, or fascist. <laughs> it just needs to get picked up and removed. And citizens don't ask you is, uh, that they'd rather have the snow removed in a Republican way or a Democratic way. <laughs> They want things done. So those labels don't mean anything. And when we remove the labels and we get rid of the ideological fiction or friction, then it's so much easier to work together, share ideas, because we all share common problems. Pete's got inf infrastructure problems. Mayor Bloom has infrastructure problems. I've got infrastructure problems. They may be different a little bit in size and scope, but we still got the same problems. And we still have to find ways to pay for yeah. stuff. We talk we share, we work together. Right. It's just that simple. So uh, you, you share ideas and, and practices. Uh, you, you share you know, the same experience of having those problems. Could it also amount to you know, a collective action that you know, uh, amounts to more than just solutions at the local level, but you know, uh, like a bottom-up push for better policies and better results? Yeah, we'll all be talking about bonds on the tax plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every one and of us. So I assume when you are talking about uh, bottom up, not you're talking about stakeholders from the community being actively involved, as well as you know um, concerted action vis-a-vis -vis other levels of government, like mm -hmm. state level government or federal government. Yeah. yeah, I can tell you as someone who came out of uh, state government uh, that I have a very cohesive relationship, not only with my local delegation, but certainly with uh, my governor as well. And I, I recognize that for us to get things done, as we talked about earlier, we have to have collaboratives. We have to not only have those collaborations taking place among elected officials, uh, but they have to take place in the sphere of public-private partnerships as well with a shared vision and a shared goal towards advancing uh, our city and moving our city uh, forward. I also like to say that I believe settings like this, the Bloomberg Harvard, US Conference for Mayors, I just took office in January. I've had a few issues that I wanted to ask other mayors about. And I picked up the phone and I called folks who I met at US Conference of Mayors or at Bloomberg and they immediately responded. And I will tell you, even beyond me picking up the phone to call, I've had mayors who have called me since I've been elected to say, what can, I do to help or to give, they've been following what's going on perhaps in my city and have shared some ideas that they think would add value to solutions that I'm moving towards. So maybe the job is not as terrible as uh, <laughs> President Johnson said, right? No, it's you're, you're not. You're not that alone. It, it, <laughs> no, right. you, know, you are not alone. I maybe there's you. even a secret handshake, <laughs> right? <laughs> Mayor Pete, last. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I mean, uh, certainly would, would echo what's been said about the, the, the community of mayors and, and how important it is because it really does, it's, it's a nationwide, bipartisan, multi-generational community of elected officials and you just don't see much of that. Um, the, and I think it's important to recognize, especially as federal government gets, gets so paralyzed, 
the extent to which these issues, the big national issues, as you mentioned, I mean, public safety, race relations, immigration, climate, are actually manifestly local. They all happen somewhere. And uh, of the ones you mentioned, climate's particularly interesting to me just because uh, that's a, a place where you can see that the community of mayors is actually becoming global. And that's a yep. really interesting phenomenon. Take the C40 or the climate mayors. Mm -hmm. You had a, a handful of mayors who came together and basically realized that between them, this handful of cities represented a quarter of the world's population. And you start thinking, not in the form of we as cities are going to pressure our national governments, but rather we as cities are just going to make commu commitments among ourselves. And if we can keep them, we don't even need to wait for our national governments to catch up to make a powerful impact. And I think the more sclerosis there is at other layers of government, the more important that'll be. Now, the asterisk on that is uh, figuring out what to do with the state level. So, you know, certainly when I was a student, we talked in politics about the relationship between the federal and state as if it was the only intergovernmental dynamic that mattered. If you ever heard about local, it was in state and, lo state and local, like it was one yeah. word. I actually think city versus state might be the inter most interesting dynamic in government today. On one hand, legally, we're nothing but a figment to the state uh, I in most cases. On the other hand, um, figuring out how much power belongs in state capitals versus making sure mayors have a, have a free hand to do the work we need to do is probably the most interesting territory in, in American federalism today. Agreed. So um, I want to thank you for all your contributions and, and sharing your, your insights and, and experiences. I want to open up uh, to the, this conversation to the audience. Uh, we have four microphones, one here, one here, and then in the booth over there, there's additional microphones. So please, if you have a question, come up to the microphone, identify yourself, and keep it short, and address it to either one or uh, all of the mayors. Sir. Hi, my name Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Shota. I'm uh, getting my master's degree here. Uh, and my question is on employee-owned uh, companies. I asked uh, uh, Mayor James this <laughs> last week. Um, uh, you know, employee-owned companies usually uh, produce uh, publicly beneficial um, 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 products. And uh, um, it, they tend to... Um, they tend to benefit society, basically. And my question is, what incentives do you have in your cities to help these type of entities? Um, and uh, what are some other incentives that can help um, um, small companies? Mary James? I, I entered it the last time, so you guys. Uh, sure. I mean, the one thing you'll mention, it's, it's always tricky when you're working with any kind of business, social enterprise or, or traditional enterprise, to figure out how a city can be helpful. And a lot of it has to do with getting out of the way. But, but I would also add that um, cities have this ability to create exchange, right, to foster the, the kind of collision of ideas where you have interesting new models in corporate governance, whether it's employee-owned companies or benefit corporations, which don't have the same B Corps, which don't have the same uh, uh, restrictions that could prevent you from, from doing good that, that exist to, to traditional uh, S corporations, uh, that you can create a, a space, whether it's through incentives or, or simply through convening power, where people who are on the cutting edge of that kind of social enterprise can get to know each other and compare notes. Uh, and often something as simple as physical proximity, even if that was presented as a pessimistic interpretation of what the city is, really can add a lot of value. I will uh, add that when I took office, one of the initiatives that we started was our equity in business initiative. And so while it is not solely focused on employee-owned businesses, that is certainly under the umbrella of our uh, discussion because it is my goal that people have access, that we create an environment for entrepreneurs, for small businesses, et cetera, that, that can thrive. And I don't want City Parish to be uh, an obstruction to that, but to be a compliment. Thank you. Um, you want to add? No, oh, I'll pass. Then we'll go to over here. Hi, my name is Betsy Cowan. I'm in the mid-career uh, master's in public administration program. I was curious if you could talk about some of the creative financing models that you found, particularly as the federal government um, might be limiting some of their CDBG and other funding. So is it social impact bonds, or are there other things that we're not thinking of yet that you might be exploring? Hmm. Thank you. All right. Good question. Yeah. We're not a big consumer of social impact bonds yet, and where we do use them at any level, it's usually related to an educational issue, although we have very little impact on education. My education advisor has worked with some of the school districts in, in our city. Um, the things that we try to do are public-private partnerships. That's, that's really where we get the best bang for the buck 
We took a $3.8 million investment in our smart city spine along our starter streetcar line and turned it into 20 million, I'm sorry, 3.8 million and turned it into $20 million by partnering with various companies like Cisco and Sprint. And in the process of doing that, we created an income stream from some of the inf uh, information on our kiosk in the form of advertising that we split with them. So we're gaining some money back, but we're also doing things. Uh, the other thing that I think we, we are doing is, you know, really, to be honest with you, the most innovative uh, um, source of revenue are our citizens. Uh, trying to find ways to work with them to A, uh, reduce uh, the expense of things creates additional revenue. So helping to work with them to find efficiencies in things like yard, yard waste, um, uh, street situations, sidewalk repair is a huge one. Those types of things that consume resources, if we can find a way to take care of it otherwise. Last thing I'll say is, is that uh, we, like Mayor Pete, have a ton of vacant and abandoned properties and our land bank is responsible for those properties and the weeds and the stuff in other people's property grows. So we've turned that into a process with our neighborhood associations where they adopt their own neighborhood. We pay them to pay kids to mow their lawn. Uh, to mow the lawns in the various areas so that it gets done um, and they're making a little money on it and we don't have to pay the full boat of having people at the highest income levels or the highest uh, wage levels do it. So I will tell you that uh, we, I have directed my uh, finance department to start thinking innovatively and creatively so we haven't gone down that path yet as it relates to uh, the bonds, social bonds that you mentioned, but we're looking at all different types of alternatives. And just last week, I had a directed directive to all of my department leaders for us to indeed start looking at efficiencies, uh, ways that we can uh, save money because, as you know, uh, it takes money to do a lot of the things that we want to do in terms of our goals and aspirations. But I can tell you, as someone who just tried a bond initiative, tried to get a bond initiative on the ballot and it did not get on the uh, ballot, to ballot, we have to look creatively and innovatively at other ways to provide funding for infrastructure and other needs of our city. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add, th there's no magic mountain out there, right? We're all, uh, we, we're intrigued by social impact financing, haven't found the right use case that wires up for us yet. Uh, we've tried a lot of things, but that, in the same way that with energy, uh, you talk about the fifth right. fuel being energy efficiency, uh, a lot of times the best place to look for, for money is to look at something you're already doing and just reprogram it, and it's the hardest thing to do. By the way, beware the initiative that will identify all the efficiencies and savings in your city if you're not prepared to exercise the political will to actually capture them, uh, which is the hardest part of all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no easy path, but, but it can be done. Thank you. Over here. My name is Philip. I work across the river at the business school. I was wondering if any of you could speak to companies like Amazon putting out RFPs and if we're <laughs> essentially engaging in a race to the bottom, given your earlier comments about collaboration among cities. Uh, again, yeah. I'll, I'll ask uh, Mayor James first because you had a wonderful campaign. Yeah. KC five stars to get Amazon to Kansas City. You know, so. 1,000 products, 1,000 reviews. Um, it worked pretty well so yeah. far. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not going to say it's a race to the bottom. I think that is a social statement that belies the impact of having 50,000 jobs in your community. Um, there are certainly some signs and things that you need to be careful of. You're going to wind up incentivizing this company. That's going to happen. I don't care how you say it. I don't care how much people dislike it. There, we live in a competitive environment, and if you want to bring 50,000 jobs and activity to your community, you're going to have to provide incentives, period, end of story. And it may not be tasteful, and people think that, oh, if you don't provide the incentives, they'll come anyhow. No, they won't. Been there, done that. It does not work like that. So this is one area where you won't share ideas and insight with your fellow mayors. <laughs> well, no, we do, as a matter of fact, okay. but we're, we're still in competition. Right. But we don't talk necessarily about the various incentives because the incentives are different from place to place. The mix of incentives are different from place to place. And then you have to layer on state incentives, which are totally different than the city and the local incentives that you're using. The, the point of the matter is that they, Amazon 
made a request with very specific criteria about uh, the size of the MSA, uh, you only submitting one uh, collective response to the RFP, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The sites, you needed 100 contiguous acres, et cetera. You needed a million square feet of office space right off the bat, all right? So by the way we looked at that, there were probably some place between 50 and 60 cities or areas that could do that. They got 283 responses to that RFP. Mm -hmm. That tells you something about the demand. You know, the, there's two types of economic currency. The very, very rare circumstance of moving a company or getting a company like that to move to your community, that's the old way, you know, everybody wanted the Ford plant, the Chevy plant, the manufacturing, and they've incentivized the heck out of those to get them there because they know that by getting them there, you're providing jobs, not just for the 50,000 people today, but for the 50,000 people next year, 50,000 people 10 years from now, and 15 years from now. That's one type of currency. The other type is talent. And the competition for talent is almost as fierce as the competition for uh, companies. So I don't apologize for it, and I don't think it's a race to the bottom. I think that there are some things that you have to be aware of, and there's probably a line that you won't cross. But once we start saying we're not going to compete, we're moving backwards exactly. and we're going to be in trouble. Mayor Weston Broom, what's your point of view on this? Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree because we didn't really meet all the criteria in Baton Rouge. But we don't say that. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, at any rate, <laughs> um, you know, you narrowed it down to a number of cities, but as he said, over 200 cities applied, and we were one of those cities because we figured the more people uh, or cities out of Louisiana that at least tried that perhaps at some point it would benefit all of us. Just for example, if, Baton, if New Orleans won, then that was gonna benefit Baton Rouge. And so if Baton Rouge won, it would benefit New Orleans. And perhaps there was some collaboration there. So I, I agree that you cannot uh, turn your back on these opportunities. If you don't try, you don't know if you will uh, succeed. And so I would not look at it pessimistically. I would look at it as an opportunity. Um, in Baton Rouge, we have IBM there, and um, we're very glad that they're, they're staying there. But of course, one of the challenges that we continue to have in cities, um, workforce, workforce, you know, having a, a, a ready workforce, a skilled workforce, but you still have to try. So we have time for two more questions, quickly. Uh, did you want to add to this? I mean, we could have a whole session on this, but, <laughs> but uh, ju just a couple of other thoughts. Uh, first of all, being from a city that knows what it's like to have tens of thousands of people in one employer and then lose it, you got to really think about uh, how you distribute the risk with your mix of employers. Um, the other thing I'd mention just about the bigger question of incentives is I think uh, they can play a role, but y you don't want to be buying jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, or to put it another way, you don't want to take a bad business decision and pump a bunch of money into the equation to turn it into a good one. What you really want to do is be the kind of place where it's a good business decision to come. And so much of the answer to that question actually, as I said, relies as much on the people as it does the real estate. Uh, now where we've come full circle is we realize one of the things that draws people is a sense of place. Uh, so making sure that you have the right kind of public spaces and neighborhoods, uh, uh, just good places to eat, all of that factors in. Companies are made of people. And in the end, if they're even talking to the mayor, They've already done the math on the land, labor, utilities, taxes, cost of doing yeah. business. They want right. to see what kind of community you have, and that'll make the difference. Interesting. Absolutely. So I'm going to take one question here and one here, and if we can hear from both of you, and then I'll give a final uh, word to all, of, all three of you. Okay, so let's hear your question first. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm Madeline. I'm a doctoral student at um, MIT in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, studying residential mobility. And so my question for you is, um, what are you doing to build cities that serve not just the residents you have right now, but to ensure that those residents can stay in your cities as they undergo life changes, like having children aging or graduating from Notre Dame, for example? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Over here. Thank you so much. My name is Apoorva Pasricha, and I'm a student at the Harvard Business School. And my question is, what is your leadership philosophy, and how has it evolved over your tenure, uh, during your tenure as mayors? Well, two great questions to end with, and only five minutes to answer them. So, <laughs> um, Mayor Pete, you want to start? Uh, sure. So, 
quickly on mobility, I, I think that the, the key there is to make sure that, that you understand that every uh, space you have should belong to as many modalities as possible. So you can imagine how it went over in the Midwest when I proposed that we would take a road that had only ever been widened and shrink it. We did mm -hmm. a road diet. Road uh, we took a, a, a one-way pair, turned it into two ways, center turn lane, shrank it. Uh, a lot of people were furious uh, because we slowed down the commute to get from one edge of the city to the other, went from 12 minutes to 14 minutes. And you would think I had banned the automobile. Um, <laughs> but the premise was that bicycles, vehicles, and, and people uh, uh, on foot can coexist peacefully on these roadways if we change our expectations about what they're for. Uh, and I think that's a conversation we're gonna have to continue to have and will be interestingly changed by automation in ways that we haven't totally come to grips with especially when it comes to how much land ought to be committed to parking. Uh, so it's a very dynamic space to be looking at. And, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, an area where, where I think a lot of mayors will be looking for, for talented people to graduate and help us figure it out. Um, on the question of leadership philosophy, uh, I'll just mention one thing, which is early on I realized that you really do need to have a philosophy of everything just to um, give you some basis for, for, for how you make decisions. And I realized that because we had some question, to be honest, I can't even remember the question, it was related to the public works. And I thought, I don't really have a f philosophical basis for public works. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought you, th there, uh, there's actually one that rests in the nature of the work that we do at the most kind of unglamor unglamorous and fundamental level. Um, but it's that people uh, rely on us to be able to live out a life that is meaningful to them. So to me, Wastewater and the meaning of life are intimately connected <laughs> in, in the following way, uh, which is uh, whatever the meaning of life is for you, I don't have to know it, might have to do with faith and family or uh, business and enterprise or, or, or public service, but whatever, whatever it is, you will be less able to live a life in accordance with that meaning, conception of meaning, if uh, you have to think about whether you can get a glass of clean, safe drinking water that won't poison your family out of the tap. And so our job is to take that problem off the table for you and to think about it so you don't have to, so that you can think about whatever's more important to you in your life. And the more we can do that, uh, that really fundamental work, which the, the, the less anybody even knows we're there, the more we're meeting our mission. Um, to me, that's kind of the essence of public service, uh, especially at the local level. And everything else that you do is built on top of that. So we now, in addition to the, the rise of cities, we've seen the rise of the mayor philosopher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so we'll keep that. Mayor Weston Broom, well, very um, briefly. Yeah. As it relates to the first question of keeping uh, our best, our, our talented individuals and encouraging others to come to our community, I will say that uh, we are really working hard on uh, connectivity in our community as it relates to transportation. We have a culture of everyone being in cars. That's part of our southern culture. So we're trying to get people on bikes, walking. We're trying to improve our public transportation system. And in addition, I am engaging millennials in part of my uh, mayor's millennial monthly meeting. And so they are participating and coming up with ideas. We'll have our first hackathon in January. And, uh, and so engaging millennials who will hopefully stay and become stakeholders is very important and making sure we provide quality of uh, place. I would say that my uh, leadership style is uh, one of being a, a servant uh, leader. And um, that has been uh, my mantra in public service for over uh, the years. I, I believe that people genuinely in this society in which we live in today, that uh, they're not so much concerned about how much you know, but how much you care about the people that you serve. And that's vitally important to me. Um, I ran for office not because of a title, but because I felt that this, like many other areas, is a calling and I, that I should uh, treat it as such, that I'm here to help people. That's what it's all about. And so at the end of the day, um, I measure uh, my success on my care and my concern for others and changing the quality and improving the quality of life uh, for those individuals that I, that I serve. If I could say one other uh, area that is really concerning, and I think that as, as mayors we can help uh, transform and change the trajectory of this, is the, the issue around uh, uh, race and classism across the nation. And so that is something that's very important to me and as mayor uh, and as a servant leader, I'm trying to bring people to the table and close that gap 
in my community. It's a tall task uh, because it, you, it has a lot to do with the hearts of individuals. And so, uh, but I'm going to keep moving forward to accomplish that goal. Thank you so much. Mary James. Very quickly, um, uh, the issue of keeping people in town, children, families, etc. First of all, I agree with everything that both of my fellow mayors have said, but transit is an absolute cornerstone of equity in cities, uh, particularly the first mile, last mile uh, problems of transit. Uh, so solve those problems. Second, even though mayors seldom have the ability to have a direct impact on schools, unlike Mayor Menino did here and, uh, and in D.C., uh, very few mayors have control of their school systems. Find a way to be engaged. Find a way to improve the school systems. Find a way to make sure that every child in your city reads proficiently by the time they finish third grade. If you do that, you'll build a workforce for the future. With regards to leadership philosophy, I have two things to say. One, you don't go wrong by doing, uh, you can't go wrong by doing right. And number two, facts and data. Uh, I stay away from politics, I stay away from opinions, I use facts and data to make decisions. And I can justify the decisions based on the facts and data. And I can live with the criticism, because I don't care what you do. You can stand on the street corner as a mayor and hand out $20 bills, 30% of the people are gonna be mad at you because it's not a 50, 25% are gonna be mad at you because you're doing it at all, and the rest of them are gonna like the 20 and be thankful. So just get used to that. Great advice. Thank you so much. I want to thank the uh, Institute of Politics, Christian Flynn, Amy Howell, Kerry Devine, Bill DeHellen, and our three fantastic mayors. Thank you so much.